Greetings in the precious name of Jesus. In our Revelation series, today we are to discuss the beastly church of Pergamum. The third church in the book of Revelation chapter 2. And we will read what chapter 2 says in verses 12 through to 17. And to the angel of uh, the church in Pergamos write, these things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Now my dear friends, we know, that uh, the, the seven churches in Asia received this message from the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church. And then the Holy Spirit takes that uh, message and gives it to all the churches, including that of yours and of mine. Now, uh, if you have followed my teachings uh, carefully, you may have made yourselves a chart in which the seven churches would be written from top to bottom in seven rows and then we'd have about eight columns to talk about the message which has been given in a sequence. Okay, now starting, let's read the verse 12 again and to the angel of the church in Pergamos write and we know already that the angel here does not mean a celestial being but the shepherd of the church. These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. The first column is the name of the church where you would now say Pergamos. And then in the second column the giver of the message is Jesus. And Jesus is described here as the one who is having the sharp double edged sword. Which is none other than the word of God. Now my dear friends throughout the Bible. The word of God is likened unto several things. Okay, Even here in the last uh, 17th verse, the word of God is uh, compared unto manna, the food that the Israelites ate in the desert. The word of God sometimes is described as manna when you eat and when you are nourished in your spiritual life. And the word of God is water in some places when the word of God does the work of cleansing. The word of God is at times the oil when we, the word of God anoints us and purifies us. And the word of God is a two-edged sword when it pierces into our system to correct us, to open the wounds and perhaps to perform a surgery in, your, in our spiritual life. Okay, of course the, the, the sword is not a surgical knife of a physician, but the double-edged sword is to cut both sides and the word of God here is represented as a double-edged sword and the Lord Jesus is using it to the message of the church in Pergamum. Now why? I believe when we go through the study you will understand that uh, the church of Pergamum had swayed away from the word of God. They were straying 
from the word of God. And the Lord would want to bring back the word of God with which he wants to judge the church. Uh, not to just cast them away, but to clean them, to cleanse them and to bring them back to the right path. So now we know that Jesus here is described as the one who is having the double-edged sword in his uh, uh, mouth. Now he actually uses the word to, to show to the people in Pergamum, the church in Pergamum, that they have gone astray from the word of God. Now, the commendation, the next column would be commendation. Look at the commendations that the Lord gives in verse 13. I know thy works. Look, when he, he said the same thing to the Ephesian church and to the church in Samana. To the Ephesian church, works meant a lot of labor, hard work, programs, and uh, things that they were performing, their performances. But the works for the people in Smyrna was persecution and poverty uh, because of the Lord. You know, they, they, they were going through suffering and they were poor because they chose to live a righteous life for God. In this case, it's a different type of work. Uh, I know thy works. The work here is not anything that they did, but the, the, the work of being who they are are in that city because that city was of all the cities that we know the most evil city i'll explain that in a minute so to be christians there was already a tumultuous task and they existed they survived as christians there so the work of the pergamum christian was to being a, a christian in that sort of an environment for some of us also, my dear friends, it would be very difficult to be Christians. Now, in some countries, Christianity is just uh, something that has been granted, uh, uh, taken for granted. Uh, they have no problem calling themselves Christians. They don't practice, they don't pray, they don't read the word, they don't go to church. But uh, if there is a form to fill against religion, they'd say Christian, nominal Christians. But there are some places in the world where you cannot make others know that you are a Christian. Because to be a Christian is difficult. Now in Sri Lanka also, in some parts of Sri Lanka, it's very difficult to live as a Christian. In the cities, no problem. In Colombo, Kandy, in main cities, you can survive as a Christian. In fact, you can have a good time as a Christian. But then uh, deep in some villages, uh, in places like where we are now, it's very difficult to be uh, Christians because of the, the, the strong culture that the Sri Lankan uh, uh, people have and uh, the interaction between cultures. And this is a country which talks about uh, the interfaith uh, toleration and interfaith acceptance. And Christians are supposed to accept the other faith. And um, Christians are usually ostracized. They are persecuted. Uh, in their own little ways, uh, quite unheard of uh, in, in the West. Many people don't know that Christians are persecuted in Sri Lanka. Now we, I myself, has, have gone, undergone a, a lot of persecution from, uh, from people, from other religious organizations, and even from the government uh, to function as a Christian in Sri Lanka. A lot of Christian people will find it very difficult to uh, let their children go to a decent school because when the children are interviewed they ask okay what religion are you and when they say we are Christians then uh, the schools are not usually given to them so in some places now Sri Lanka is way much better off compared to some other countries where it is so difficult for people to survive as Christians and Pergamum was uh, such a place where it, it was too difficult for people to be Christians. And when I explain about Pergamum, then you will know what I'm talking about, right? So your, I know your works, I know thy works, mean that they survived as Christians in Pergamos. And where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Ooh. Look, Satan's seat, I'm going to explain to you what that is, okay? And thou holdest fast my name, right? 
and has not denied my faith even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr. And we are told here that a guy called Antipas had been killed because of the Lord in Pergamum. I'm going to explain uh, that to you in a minute. Who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Now, I have a lot to say about the seat of Satan, my dear friends. For that, we need to understand what sort of a place Pergamum was. Pergamos. The, the, the real name of Pergamum means citadel. It was a city erected on a high platform, on a hill. It was a hill station and it was a very prominent place those days. Now Pergamos was a religious center as well. There were three temples for the emperor of Rome alone. Okay, And there were four main Temples for the Greek gods. Okay. Zeus, temple of Zeus was the chief temple. And the Greek Zeus is equal to the Roman Jupiter. Okay. Look at the number. Seven temples. Seven main temples. On top of the main tem temples, there were little, little shrines here and there. Uh, because people were so religious in that city, in a very evil way, I'm going to explain. And of the f seven temples, three were the temples for the Roman Emperor. From time to time, when the Emperor changes, the, the deity changes, okay? Uh, if uh, when Tiberius was the uh, Emperor, Tiberius was the god in those three temples. Okay, when somebody else became the emperor, that, that person became the, uh, when Nero, Domitian, Caligula, when, when one after another these uh, emperors changed, the gods also changed in those three temples. And uh, on top of the three temples for the emperors, there were four main huge temples to Greek gods. And uh, the, the, the chieftain of all, the main of all was the temple in Zeus. I'll come, come, come to that uh, in a minute. But uh, before talking about the temples, I would like to talk about the city itself. What sort of a city it was. Pergamos was a place where some educated people lived. Not like in Ephesus, because in Ephesus, you remember, I told you that each and every one in Ephesus was an educated man and a woman. Now, Pergamos did not have completely educated people, but there were a lot of educated people because there was a huge library. You know, in those days, there was a library with 200,000 volumes. Okay, most of them written on papyrus and some in another material and I'm going to explain that. Okay, now do you know where papyrus was uh, produced in Egypt. By the shores of the river Nile, there was this
became the parchment. The parchment is the forerunner of paper. So the, the library of Pergamos not only had uh, material written on uh, the Egyptian papyrus reeds, papyrus, but also the parchment. And Cleopatra was so happy that this new writing material is also now down in Alexandria. Alexandria became a very prominent library. Okay. Coming back to Pergamos, as I said, uh, the huge library, but by the time John came there, there was no library, okay? But uh, it had a very bad religious uh, influence there. Now I'm going to talk to you about the Satan's uh, seat. Now, demonology, Satanology is a very grave subject and uh, if you want to know what I have done uh, by way of study of demonology, I have uh, I segregated three years of my studious life to investigate upon demons and Satan and I have studied demonology for three years, okay? And so I'm, I know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about demonology. And if there is anybody who is interested in studying demonology, I would discourage you to the maximum. Don't try to study it. There are things that we do uh, at the time of doing it would be very interesting but then later on you realize why did I do? Did the Lord really lead me to do? And if you ask me, okay Suresh you tell me did the Lord lead you to study demonology? I would say no, no the Lord never led me to study demonology. It was purely out of my own curiosity that I studied uh, demonology because I laid my hands on some wonderful books written by Derek Prince as early as 1986 and then I because I I come I myself come from a very strong and staunch Hindu background we had a lot of uh, demonic activity in our home you know if somebody uh, steals something we had a lot of servants because as Hindus we were rich and if uh, somebody stole something uh, we had uh, demonic ways to discover who the thief was and I was so much exposed to demonic activities which was at that time in our favor. Demonic activities that we performed when we were Hindus were not quote and unquote detrimental to us but it was beneficial. Only after becoming Christians that we realized that uh, we had done things that were quite detrimental in, uh, to our lives uh, at large. Uh, and, and because of that and uh, because I had uh, c laid my hands on uh, material of Derek Prince and many other scholars who had uh, done a lot of uh, research on demonology, I started uh, studying demonology and uh, I have done a lot of research, three years, not a short period of time. The you know books of bla black magic and uh, Solomon's black book etc etc. So if you know about what I'm talking about, then you know what and what researches have I done pertaining to demonology. But if you ask me, Suresh, can we also study a little bit of demonology, I would ardently uh, discourage you doing that because it's not necessary. Okay? But having done that demonology, it was easier for me to understand the spirit of uh, Pergamos because this is the only place where God himself associates Satan with a particular place on earth. Now, when we study Babylonology, we know that after the deluge, the first kingdom that sprang up on earth was between two rivers, namely Euphrates and Tigris. And in the Akkadian language, the, the civilization was called Mesa Po Tamia, the civilization between two rivers, which in English we quite comfortably pronounce Mesopotamia. Okay. Now in that first kingdom came a first, first king called Gilgamesh, who in our Bible is addressed with a nickname Nimrod, meaning the great hunter. In studying demonology and Babylonology, we may be able to discover 
that Babylon was the place that Satan chose as his capital on earth. From then to now and even to the future, until the book of Revelation, chapters 17 and 18, where I will be talking about the destruction of the spiritual Babylon, economical Babylon, and the political Babylon. Babylon exists in camouflaged forms. And therefore, I would have no perturbance if the Lord says, Babylon is the seat of Satan. But now I am perturbed when he says, Pergamos is the seat of Satan. Pergamos, a, a, a little city in Asia Minor, near Turkey, current day Turkey, Istanbul, is called the seat of Satan over against the Iraqian city of Babylon, which is in the Middle East. How come? And for that we need to know the temple of Zeus. I told you there existed seven great temples on top of all these minor little shrines. Of the seven temples, three were segregated to the Roman emperors, the other four to the Greek gods. The chieftain of all was Zeus. Okay, In a foregone uh, uh, segment, I explained briefly about the god called Zeus. Okay. The Greek Zeus is the Roman Jupiter, but here in Pergamos, the Zeus cult was thriving to a mammoth scale, to an unimaginable and unfathomable level. Because Pergamos, being a citadel city, was a thriving city, and a thriving city attracts people. And people wanted to know how you are thriving. And the, the answer was the temple of Zeus. The, the god Zeus was seen as the fertility god, blessing people. And if they are to receive the blessing of this god Zeus, then they would have to please that god. And at a snail pace, not not, not very fast, not swiftly, but at a snail pace, the belief in that Zeus deity grew to a level where they started offering human sacrifices to that God. Hey, you know what? The, the te temple of Zeus, the altar of Zeus was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Many people know that there existed seven wonders of the ancient world, but the altar of Zeus was one of those. It was humongous, huge. And from behind the, the altar of Zeus, the Zeus priests stood in line because the activities that they were indulged in demanded a lot of physical strength. One person could not perform all the rites because it involved human sacrifices. You know what? By the time John wrote the book of Revelation, no less than 300 humans were sacrificed in a single day in that temple, on that altar. Okay? Huge temple was it, with columns and you know the Greek types of uh, temples. And uh, I would ask my media team to find some pictures and uh, uh, play them for you to see, right? The temple and uh, the altar of Zeus, because in our study, I have a lot to talk about the, the altar of Zeus, okay? Now, one after another, people were brought to that altar and the priests stood with long, sharp knives. And the, 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 the victim, the, sacrif the, the sacrifice would be brought and the, 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 the head was placed on that altar and the priest chanted and chuck, he chopped the head off and the blood flew to, was flowing through that and a huge drain was cut for hundreds of thousands of gallons of blood to be drained to huge um, drainage systems that they had uh, cut for the blood to be buried. Now, 
no less than 300 thousands literally thousands of people were sacrificed on a daily basis on that altar and if you went there you would see a lot of cages like in a zoo where these animals are kept but instead of animals you would see a lot of women children and some men because a majority of the human sacrifices were women because Zeus was a male god and to offer a female human sacrifice would soothe him and therefore he would uh, bless the sacrificer. A lot of husbands from many parts of the world brought their wives to be sacrificed. A lot of parents brought their children, mostly daughters, to be sacrificed. And a lot of people purchased slaves only to come and sacrifice. And if somebody showed up to Pergamos without a sacrifice, there was always sacrifice available for sale in those cages. Tens of cages full of people. So all you have to do is to go and pay the money and choose for yourself uh, a, a, an appropriate uh, person to be sacrificed. The most healthy looking, healthy looking and pretty looking person would be the most ideal sacrifice to uh, Zeus. Boy, I'll tell you, hundreds of thousands of people were massacred by way of sacrifice to the god Zeus. Now, demonolo demonologically, Satan or the demons which associate themselves to an idol or an object would get accustomed to what transpires in their altar and they attach themselves to what happens there and they begin to like what happens and this demon this Satan rather Satan of Zeus was so attached to the human sacrifices he could not forget it okay now eventually uh, Pergamos fell because when the Roman Empire fell Pergamos which was under the Roman Empire also fell and uh, went to become ruins. Now let me fast forward to 1878. Now what I was talking about pertained to the first century. Okay. Now let's come to 1878. Karl Humann a young German engineer was building roads and railroads uh, in that part of the world in 1878 and he ran out of uh, pebbles and rock when he was told in the outskirts of the vicinity of them building the roads uh, they had seen some loose rock so Karl Humann went and uh, examined those rocks and thought wow these are wonderful for our road works and then he went and uh, uh, used those rocks okay now he started to spot the rocks as early as 1875 for three years he was using those stones and in 1878 when all the rock on the surface were used up he had to dig to unearth more rock because the rock was so wonderful, very appropriate for road building. He saw some unusual looking, properly carved, decent looking rocks. And he swiftly knew that these had to do with some ancient ruins. Okay. So Karl Humann, with the help of a uh, a German archaeologist, now this guy was also a German, with another German uh, uh, archaeologist, right? Uh, this was Karl Humann. He contacted Rudolf Hoffmann, a friend of his, and said, Hey, you come down here. There are some nice looking rocks, perhaps witnessing some uh, ancient uh, ruins. And then this guy went. And together they unearthed what? 
the temple of Zeus. The temple of Zeus was unearthed and it was intact. Only was buried, only it was buried, but it was quite intact. And with the, the German Kaiser, William II at that time, they obtained official permission to remove these and uh, transport them to Berlin and uh, reconstruct them and show the people as a museum. Okay, it took 10 years between 1878 and 1888. One by one, the rocks were removed subsequent to being numbered, okay? Now you remember, if you know a little bit of history, you would know how the London Bridge was dismantled and taken to Arizona in the United States and re-erected there. Do you know that? Now many people know the rhyme, London Bridge is falling down, but they don't know the history behind it. There was this London Bridge which was going to fall down and then uh, the, they, they didn't know what to do and they just decided to uh, destroy it when an American rich entrepreneur approached and obtained uh, permission to buy the London Bridge and take it back to America. And he came, he, he, he bought the London Bridge, dismantled it and hauled the rocks through the river Thames to the uh, ocean and then shipped everything to Arizona and uh, erected. And I have personally been to that place. I have person, personally been on the current London Bridge in Arizona in America. Okay, Now, like that, this temple of Zeus was dismantled. Every rock was numbered appropriately. Within 10 long years, was exported uh, to Berlin in Germany and they started erecting it. And in 1907, they opened the Temple of Zeus in Berlin and called it the Pergamon Museum. Pergamon, not Pergamum or Pergamos, but Pergamon museum. Now my dear friends, I'll ask you a question. What would happen to that Satan which was so bloodthirsty and enjoying the blood of humans? Minimum 300 a day. Humongous, isn't it? That spirit was reactivated. 1907 was the year when the spirit of Pergamum, the Satan's seat, was reactivated in Berlin. And in this study, my dear friends, I'm going to show you how Berlin became the center of demonic activity in triggering the First World War, the Second World War, the Cold War, and parenting all the wars that are happening today in the world in this year 2015. It's the spirit of Pergamum which is functioning, reactivated and is functioning. Receiving the human blood sacrifice in a different form. No longer like uh, those days on the altar but in a different way. Now I have time and again mentioned about my book and I told you if you want my book I'm not advertising, I'm not selling, write to us and I will send this book free of charge to you. In this I have inscribed material which may if spoken sound boring but when read intriguing. So I don't say everything that I have written. But now I have to read to you some of the stuff that I have written here pertaining to the reactivation of the spirit in Pergamum. To that my dear friend I would like to add a verse of scripture found in Matthew chapter 12 verses 43 to 45. Matthew chapter 12 verses 43 to 45. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, 
He walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of the ma that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Jesus was the one who said this. When an, when an evil spirit leaves somebody, the spirit wants to come back to that place again. And if that place is empty, the spirit will not just come alone, but would go back and bring seven more wicked spirits. Okay? Now, my dear friends, if this is true of an individual, how much more true would it be to an entire temple that was so glorifying Satan to the brim, to the maximum? Hmm? The temple of Zeus was submerged in sand and 18 centuries later is unearthed, dismantled hauled abroad and reconstructed and reopened. The Satan behind, the spirit behind that temple would now be reactivated and, and, and uh, the Satan would see there is no blood. There is no blood. This is no longer that temple. It is intact, reconstructed, but the sacrifices have not resumed and that spirit becomes bloodthirsty. Now that was the temple which was called by Jesus himself as the seat of Satan. To the Christians in Pergamum, Jesus says, I know where you dwell. You dwell where the seat of Satan is. But now my dear friends, as from 1888, the seat of Satan began to be in Berlin and from 1907 wow it's even intact and ready to function but unable to function and therefore the spirit devised plans to obtain that blood sacrifice do you know what happened let me read from my book okay you know, in 1907 itself, uh, there were insurgencies and uh, problems against the Kaiser. And the rule of uh, the Kaiser was brought down. He was dethroned and monarchy was uh, stopped and democracy stepped in. But in 1914, do you know what happened? The First World War started. August the 1st. 1914, the spirit succeeded in triggering what became the quote-unquote Great War or World War I. Do you know when they started this war, not the Allies, when the Allies started this war, they called this war the war to stop all the wars. Okay, That was how they called that war because for the first time in world history, a world war had commenced. Of course, there were wars and battles throughout the history past, but never did the entire world engage in war uh, like in the First World War. And the war that was started to stop all wars became the triggering factor of all the wars that are happening even to this day. Okay, August the 1st, 1914 was the day. This murderous spirit succeeded in launching what was to become the Great War, okay? On that day, Germany declared war against Russia. The first declaration of war was on the part of Germany declaring war against Russia. See, the de de devil in Pergamum, in Berlin, caused the officials in Berlin to trigger the war. It started there. Okay, two days later, on the 3rd of August, Germany declared war against France. North, August the 1st, and then towards the West, August the 3rd. 
And then Germany, German forces invaded Belgium in the nights of August 3rd and 4th, even without declaring war against Belgium. Okay, this was a sheer invasion. Okay, and uh, that was when Great Britain declared war against Germany in defense of Belgium because Germany did not declare war against Belgium but merely invaded and on the 4th of August Great Britain uh, decided to fight against Germany. Now I'll read something and if you are not interested uh, don't worry but if I read this this is a kind of thing that transpired for the first time in human history my dear friends. Okay, Look at the way how this war began to spread throughout the earth, okay, from east to west. Subsequently, Austria-Hungary declared war against Russia on August the 5th, Serbia against Germany on August 6th, Montenegro against Austria-Hungary on August 7th, and against Germany on August 12th, France against Austria-Hungary on August 10th, Great Britain against Austria-Hungary on August 12th. Japan against Germany. Many people don't know that. Why? Because in the Second World War, which became very famous than the First World War, Japan and Germany were allies, weren't they? When Hitler was trying to conquer Europe, German, the, the Japanese were trying to conquer the eastern part of the world and America by bombing Hawaii. Remember the Pearl Harbor? Okay, Japan against Germany. So Japan was against Germany during the First World War, okay? On August 23rd. Austria-Hungary against Japan on August 25th and against Belgium on August 28th. On 6th April 1917, the United States entered into war against Germany, which came as a crushing blow to the latter. Both during the First and the Second World Wars, when the United States stepped in, that was when the enemy was really crushed. Okay, now look at this staggering numbers. Okay, the war eventually involved 32 countries, 28 of which were allies, right, supporting Great Britain, France, and Russia. Amazing. For the first time in human history. Okay. 32 nations of the world were in active war. Never, never again, never in the history had such a thing transpired. How, how, how? Are we going to say merely because of somebody's greed or some, somebody's want to conquer another nation? Hey, you know what? Egypt conquered many nations and became a superpower, followed by Assyria which became a superpower only to be crushed by Babylonia, which became a superpower. And Medes and the Persians got together in 536 uh, BC and crushed Babylonia and they became a world power. In turn were crushed by Alexander the Great in 334 BC and Greece became the world power. And they were crushed by the Romans. Remember Pompey the Great and uh, Julius Caesar, right, becoming the first uh, emperor of Rome. So from time and again, we have seen in human history that nations fought against nations and became superpowers. But never ever in any preceding history that 32 nations fought against each other. But that happened, happened in 1914. How? Do you see any connection between how the war was triggered in Berlin in comparison to the Pergamon Museum, I see it, I see it, okay. I have some other information to tell you also. By the time the war ended in 1918, just a four year old war of the 65 million men and women mobilized, listen to this, over 10 million were killed, 10 million people were killed and more than 20 million wounded that again would be bloodshed, right? And this is not including the millions of people who died from all over the world due to various after effects of the war. The Great Depression followed, right? People starved to death. Things happened that were 
that stemmed from uh, World War I and uh, the spirit uh, was so uh, bloodthirsty, kept on killing people. Okay. Now I have written in my book, the bloodthirsty spirit of Pergamum was happy to have shed such a lot of blood just in four years. Wow, what a compensation for the devil to not have had blood for 18 centuries and now triggered and brought back to life was now getting blood log stock and barrel with interest. Wow. Now, it did not stop there. Another great war was on the horizon, again from Berlin, okay? The current hometown of the Temple of Pergamum, the Second World War of 1939 to 1945, okay? Now, many people would call the years between the First and the Second World Wars as the silent period. But I have mentioned in my book that that was far from silent. A lot of things were happening. Germany was now rising again under a young fanatic called Adolf Hitler. He was a Prussian soldier, not Russia, Prussia, okay? Some people pronounce it Prussia, but it's originally called Prussia. He was from Austria-Hungary, right? Uh, son of a half Jew, ooh, what an irony, right? And uh, was an artist, a pathetic fellow, was very naughty in school, kicked out of school. He was not given any job because he did not fare. He was a lethargic, lazy idiot. And he would draw. The only good thing he did was he could draw. He was an artist, right? But then he joined the Prussian army in the First World War. And he saw, he saw how Germany and the Prussian army were crushed in 1918. And with, he could not take that uh, blow. He could not simply tolerate it. And the devil used him to become the, 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 uh, the instigator of the Second World War. But you know, this good for nothing fellow who was not faring well in school, who could not find a job for himself, uh, an apparently good for nothing useless young lad became the savior of the world because the, the spirit of Pergamum raised him to become the great Führer who caused havoc on earth during the Second World War. I would now like to draw your attention to things that happened within the 21 years between the First World War and the Second, between 1918 and 1939. Very interesting. How the spirit of Pergamum gained momentum in the world to be able to trigger the Second World War. Okay. Now, after the death of Vladimir Lenin of Russia in 1924, a granite mausoleum based upon the design of the Pergamon altar of Zeus was built for him and opened in 1929. Oh la la, the Russians now have a podium built after the fashion of the altar of Zeus. The spirit of Pergamon now is influencing Russia. To date, that podium is in Russia. And that's why, my dear friends, we know that Russia has always been a bad guy. Yes, right? Although under Mikhail Gorbachev, the United Soviet Socialist Republic fell. The Prime Minister of Mikhail Gorbachev, Vladimir Putin, became the president of the collapsed union under Russia. Even to date, Vladimir Putin is the president of Russia. Yes, they lost their former glory. Yes, they lost their Iron Curtain. Yes, they lost a lot of their countries. But, Russia played a very evil role in the Cold War, which of which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But also to date, Russia is a precarious place. And to date, the, the altar of Pergamon is there in Leningrad. Okay? Now let's uh, turn our attention to Germany again. Now, back in Germany, the Ishtar Gate and the Processional Way 
from the excavations of Babylon were also reconstructed in Germany okay, and temporarily accommodated in the Kaiser Friedrich um, Museum. Okay. Now the spirit of Pergamon influenced Hitler in a great way. Hitler may have not known, people may have not known, but uh, Hitler was a product of the spirit of Pergamon because that spirit chose this apparently good for nothing fellow who was a little bit loose upstairs as his potential candidate. And let me see, let me show you what happened to Hitler. He was a Roman Catholic, but he subscribed to secular philosophies of that day. Okay, He was into Guruism and Hinduism, even demonism. He was sexually associated with a lot of witches and a lot of witches cast spells on him positively and against his uh, uh, enemies negatively and he was very much into the in new age thinking but the new age thinking was not yet prominent under the title new age but he was into that and he took the Hindu swastika only changing the side and he duped the people to the extent where they said we will have the swastika on our breasts, the cross in our hearts. What a compromise, what a compromise. Swastika on the breast but the cross in the hearts. And he had that cross marked on the planes and on the tanks and all the weapons that he used during the Second World War. That was uh, in a way to, to show that he was also a Christian, you know, he was a Roman Catholic. So he was trying to appease the Christians because, because Germany was largely a Catholic and a Protestant uh, nation. It was a Catholic nation till Martin Luther came in 1526 when he brought uh, Protestantism, uh, Protestants were also thriving. So. Catholicism and Protestantism were both equally thriving in Deutschland, in Germany and therefore he wanted to appease the Christians. That's why the cross. But swastika, his faith. Okay. Now, uh, he said the heaviest blow that ever struck humanity, he said, was the coming of Christianity. Mm. He wanted to therefore purify the culture purify the nation and he brought in the idea of uh, pure Arianism, right? Pure uh, Arian, uh, not Arianism but Arian uh, uh, race, right? And he duped the people to sing the song called Silent Night in this manner. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. Only the Chancellor, steadfast in fight, watches over Germany by day and night, always caring for us, always caring for us. Amazing, isn't it? Many people don't know that uh, Hitler himself claimed to be the returned Christ, the returned Savior. And people thought that he was the Savior, hence the title Führer, hence the great Heil Hitler. Hitler be praised. And Hitler was this sort of a devil's stooge used by the Pergamum spirit. Okay. And uh, the Roman Catholic Church did not excommunicate him. Why? Again, they were also into they were also duped to believe that uh, whatever he said was true. And in my book I go on to talk about uh, the Nazis favor that he uh, received and uh, then eventually in 1933 he became the, the greatest unshakable man on earth and then he started the second world war in 1939 he decided to inv invade Poland and we know what uh, happened then. And I have given all the details of how the war started and uh, the war involved uh, 
every part of the world from 1939 to 1945 and uh, I'm from Sri Lanka. Even Sri Lanka saw bombs falling in Colombo and in a place called Trincomalee and uh, Sri Lanka also was involved uh, in the war because uh, we were under the British government. India, Pakistan, Pakistan was not there but it was part of India and Burma, Malaya which, which is now Malaysia and uh, Singapore and uh, the entire eastern world. The, J the Japanese in the east, Adolf Hitler in the west, they together were causing havoc. And here are some of uh, the figures of death and destruction. The death toll of World War, War II was four times higher than the First World War. Okay, Death toll was between 40 to 60 billion. Why? Because we don't know. Many were um, MIA, missing in action. Okay, And the death toll did not stop there. The post-World War II world saw many deaths due to gunpowder pollution, scarcity of food and other facilities. You remember the atom bombs that fell over Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Even babies that are born there today uh, show signs of uh, those chemical reactions in their body and therefore they have a lot of problems there even to date. But not only Hiroshima and Nagasaki, even in Germany, England, France, Belgium and many parts where the war was very active, people are still struggling, suffering from the post-war syndromes. Okay, And uh, eventually what happened, we know that the Second World War ended when the Allies came from the West to Berlin and the Soviet, uh, the Russians came from the East and they cornered Hitler who committed suicide in his bunker. And uh, the world was divided into two. After the end of the World War, the Western world was divided into two one under the Allies and the other under Soviet Union. And every part that was under Soviet Union became communist and they were, the, they were called the Red Countries. And right after the world, Second World War started what we know as the Cold War. Do you know that right after the Second World War, because the Soviets had conquered Berlin, they did something very funny. They took the Pergamon altar to Leningrad in 1948. They took the real uh, Pergamon altar back to uh, Soviet Union in 1948 to Leningrad. And do you think that the spirit of Pergamon would be quiet? And that was when the spirit of Pergamon began to influence the Soviet Union to become the bad guy of the world. And let me tell you what happened to them. Okay, Now that triggered the Cold War and the Cold War lasted until 1991. Okay, And Cold War, many people don't know what Cold War means. Cold War means it happened always when uh, in, in the cold areas like the Barent Sea uh, in, uh, up there amidst snow and all the minus degrees submarines uh, between the United States and Russia. It ended only in 1991 and uh, look I will read you some uh, interesting information. The Soviet Union sent troops to preserve the communist rule in East Germany in 1953, to Hungary in 1956, to Czechoslovakia, which later became two countries of Czech and Slovakia in 1968, and to Afghanistan in 1979. My dear friends, the Soviet Union sent their forces to Afghanistan to maintain their iron rule there. They trained the locals who were in favor of Soviet Union. Okay, The Afghan people at that time who were sort of innocent were trained by 
Soviet Union. Listen. And those people were subscribing to the ideologies of the Soviet Union. What United States did was, the United States stepped into Afghanistan and trained those who were against these Iron Curtain people. Russia and America were fighting a cold war along the Barent Sea. But in places like Afghanistan, Russia supported some people, those who, some people who subscribed to their views, and then America went and supported the opponents. So the people of Afghanistan were divided into two. One part supported by Soviet Union, trained by Soviet Union with Soviet Union armory, and the other supported, funded, and trained by the United States Armory. Eventually, do you know what happened? When Al-Qaeda grew to become an organization, and when Osama bin Laden was able to uh, dupe the Taliban into believing his statutes, Afghanistan Taliban people began to use these two trainings and their armory to fight against the West. Eventually, when the United States was trying to uh, locate Osama bin Laden along the Tora Bora of Afghanistan, they were attacked by their own weapons, their own uh, former people who were their stooges. So, even Taliban, Al-Qaeda and all these current problems stemmed from the Cold War, which stemmed from the Second World War, which in turn stemmed from the First World War, which was triggered by the Pergamon spirit. Can you see that? Now, in Leningrad, the, the Zeus uh, podium is now in Leningrad. And then... Uh, the, the United States restored and helped overthrow a left-wing government in Guatemala in 1954. Supported an unsuccessful invasion of Cuba in 1961. Invaded, invaded the Dominican Republic in 1965 and Granada in 1983. And undertook an unsuccessful effort to prevent a communist North Vietnam from bringing South Vietnam under its rule from 1964 to 1975. My dear friends, if you, if you go to America today, even on roads, you will have people, old people holding, uh, uh, holding boards saying Vietnam War veteran, Korean War veteran. Why? Because Vietnam, North Vietnam and North Korea were all under Soviet Union and the Cold War spread to the eastern part of the world in uh, disguise. Many people don't know, but what I'm trying to tell you is this, my dear friends. Now, you may wonder why am I talking about these wars and these problems. I am linking every single war that is happening on earth today to the spirit of Pergamum. That's what I'm trying to do. And America, being such a humongously powerful nation, lost to North Korea, lost to North Vietnam, lost in Guatemala, uh, lost in Colombia. Why? How, how could such a powerful nation lose these small battles? Because they didn't know that they were fighting against forces that were triggered by the spirit of Pergamum. Okay? And I, I believe that this will not end because as long as the spirit of Pergamum is active, shedding of blood would continue on earth. Okay, now many people are associating uh, uh, this with uh, eschatology, opening up of seals, etc. My dear friends, I want to point to a very important matter here. Many eschatological teachers, they are not eschatologists, but those who teach eschatology very happily say that now the pale horse has come, now the, the red horse has come, the black horse has come, blah, blah, blah. Not realizing that everything that happens from Revelation chapter 4 would happen only after the rapture of the church. Okay, now 
only eschatologists, certified eschatologists like myself, there are certified eschatologists who have really dealt with the book of Revelation would know that anything that happens from chapter 4 of Revelation would happen only after the rapture of the church. People who don't know that look at the wars of the, the world and they remember what Jesus said in Matthew 24. Jesus said you will hear about wars and rumors of wars and never in human history has there been so many wars since the dawn of the 20th century. And therefore, these teachers quite comfortably associate all the current problems, the, the rising of ISIS and, uh, and their killings and Taliban, Al-Qaeda and world terrorism and etc. etc. and associate them with the horses. I would say, hang, hang, hang on there a minute. They, these wars have nothing to do with Revelation chapter 4 and onwards. These wars have to do with the seat of Satan, the spirit of Pergamon, which was opened in 1907. Quite different to what's going to happen during the seven year period of tribulation. Are you with me now? Okay. Now, finally, in talking about the seat of Satan, I'm going to tell you my personal experience. When I translated the book of Revelation from Greek into uh, Aramaic, when I discovered that this seat of Satan was a very important uh, place for me to go and research, it was quite easy for me to go because it was in Berlin and I was in England. And to travel from England to Berlin was quite simple. And my friend, uh, Pastor C. M. Prem Kumar of the Open Door Mission Church in Berlin uh, is a very good friend of mine and I go there quite often. And those days from England, I used to go there quite often. And I thought, okay, in one of my visits, I'm going to visit the, the, the Museum of Pergamum. Uh, and then I'm going to do my research. I'm going to read all those uh, elements there and uh, do a research. But every time I decided to visit the uh, Pergamum Museum, which was about 20 minutes away from the home of that pastor, something terrible happened. Either that pastor fell ill or his wife had a problem or I had a problem uh, or something happened to stop me from going into that temple. And uh, sometimes I would say, okay, I will go all by myself and I would get into a vehicle and I would start driving only to have a flat tire. And, and, and then when we, by the time we repair the uh, flat tire, something else would happen. Till 1998, the Lord did not let me go into that temple. The Lord spoke to me very clearly and said, no, you are not going in there. Then in 1998, I decided, no, I am going into that place because it's not good for me to not research because look, I have gone into museums, the British Museum. I was a very frequent visitor uh, to the British Museum uh, for my researches. So this is Berlin, come on. This is just uh, a stone throws a, uh, a stone throw away. And I would go anyway and I determined to go. And finally I got Pastor Prem Kumar and another brother called Brother Dure and all three of us went. And I said, no matter what, I'm going. And finally we went and parked the vehicle. And then at that time I heard the Lord saying to me, now don't go in. I'm not allowing you to go in. I don't want you to go in. But I made a very common mistake many people commit. I said, he that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. No matter wh how powerful the spirit is, I am going in there. And then I went in. That was the time I felt the Lord leaving me literally. I just felt so redundant. I just felt so empty. I was, I felt myself so bankrupt in every way, in my spirit. I became a dud, nothing was I. When I went, I really felt the Lord leaving me alone. Pastor Prem Kumar and Brother Durai were with me. In fact, they did not come to research and they didn't know what they were uh, looking at until I told them afterwards. 
But I went and I painfully, I had a tumultuous headache and an excruciating stomachache as soon as I entered. Unbearable was it, but I was determined to, to, to finish this that I had started. And from one corner to the end, I started reading all the inscriptions and I walked along the way these human sacrifices would be drawn in. And I went and stood at the podium where the priest would stand and chant uh, before slaughtering the, the humans. And I went to that Pergamum altar and I saw where the, 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 the gallons of blood would flow, the drain and everything. And I read everything there and, and, and I even touched that and I felt so sordid, so painful. I, you know, that sort of an experience never recurred in my life, never had occurred prior to that. And I felt so abandoned by God. God just left me. And the spirit had an opportunity to even kill me. I don't know why the spirit didn't kill me because I was so vulnerable. Perhaps, perhaps I retrospectively remembered what the Lord told, the, uh, told Satan when, when he was talking about Job. But remember Job was a good guy and the Satan wanted to test him. But in this occasion I was a bad guy. Nonetheless, maybe Maybe the Lord told Satan, I am leaving him, but don't touch his life. Perhaps that's why my life was untouched. I came out alive, but I was so broken. I fell ill and everything. And the Lord decided to close the door of Berlin to me. That was the last time I preached in Berlin. Although I'm invited to Berlin and uh, I even go to Berlin, God doesn't allow me to preach in Berlin. I don't know how long is this embargo going to be, but uh, to date the Lord has not allowed me to speak in Berlin. I have never preached in Berlin ever since. And I came out and the first thing I told Pastor Premkwar and Brother Dure is this, never come here again, don't bring anybody here. Ever since, I'm telling people, don't ever go to the Pergamum Museum. My dear friends, I went to where the Satan's seat was and I felt it. It was so bad, so powerful in an evil sense. I could see how the spirit was so powerful and dubious enough to, to use a man like Hitler to destroy the world and cause such a lot of bloodshed. And uh, if any of you would want to visit the Museum of Pergamum, please don't do that. It may be about 8 to 12 euros entrance fees. Simple task to do, don't do that, don't go. And I remember in 1936, I was not there. I, when I say I remember, it doesn't mean that I was there, but I remember teaching about what happened in 1936. A group of uh, Nazis had a pageant from the Pergamum Museum to Hitler's parliament holding slogans against the Old Testament. The Old Testament was ostracized by the Germans, especially the Nazis, from the Pergamum Museum all the way to Hitler's parliament. They torched, they burnt uh, all the Old Testament and uh, that uh, triggered the anti-Semitism. <laughs> I forget even the simple, you know what, I am disturbed now. I am disturbed because I talked about the my experience in the Pergamum Museum and uh, I would want Ramesh and them, don't edit this, just just put it as it is, edit Karandipa, because uh, I want uh, the real feeling to come. Anti-Semitism is a common word and I couldn't even pronounce that because my thoughts have reverted to the Pergamum Museum and I am sweating now although it's raining. Um, and uh, I, I can feel that evil all over again and I think it's time for me to stop. You wouldn't feel the stopping and starting but I'm going to stop, have a little cup of tea and a little bit of a rest and a recuperation and then I'll, ca I'll come back again. Mm -hmm.